Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to Rocky Mountain Readings, where uh, we've been reading this week of the wonderful book, Triumph After All, by uh, Ms. Bina Kuzic. Uh, and this is just a gut-wrenching story uh, about her mother's uh, 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 journey uh, being captured at just 14 years of age and, and put into Auschwitz uh, concentration camp. And uh, hopefully... Uh, uh, today we we hear about all the triumph after all, but this is a highly recommended book. It's well written. Uh, she's an educator, and so it is written clear and clean. More than that, uh, you women are going to love this. It is just loaded with old school Romanian style uh, Jewish recipes, and uh, I encourage everybody uh, to check it out. Uh, you can get a copy or, or find links uh, on her website, askbina.com. That's www.askbina.com. And uh, you can uh, click to the Amazon link. You can buy it on Kindle edition for only $3.99 US or order a paperback version. Uh, but it's a wonderful book. And this time of year, as a change of pace for us, it's just nice to hear an actual story. And today, um, you know, and also I got to re uh, remind uh, you, the audience, um, if we want to have Bina on tomorrow in a Zoom meeting, if we have some questions, I need to hear back from some people. Um, do you folks want to have a Zoom meeting? Uh, there's no sense if I'm not going to have any interaction. Bina's flying from uh, Massachusetts back to Florida today. And so uh, I have to let her know if we're going to do a Zoom meeting. But there's no sense doing a Zoom meeting unless we have uh, um, unless we have interest in doing such. Uh, it, we, it was such a joy to have her on the show on uh, Monday to share uh, um, a presentation with us. And you can just tell this has been part of her everyday life and how it took her mother over 65 years to open up and talk about the horrors of Auschwitz. Uh, so today we're on, uh, chapter seven on page 50 in the paperback. Um, chapter seven is called bid gosh. Um, and of course she starts off with some Psalms that she believes are relevant to the chapter, the wicked walk on every side, Hashem, God of my salvation, the day through whose night I cried out is before you. Let my prayer come before you for my soul is sated with troubles and my life has reached the grave. I was reckoned with those who descend to the pit among the dead who are free, like the corpses lying in the grave, whom you remember no more. They were cut off by your hand. I am imprisoned and cannot leave. Uh, you give them their food in its proper time. He gives bread to the hungry. Hashem releases the bound. All right. The second ride Remember, uh, her mother was put on a train being taken out of Auschwitz, Auschwitz by this time. The second ride in the closed cattle car was similar to our ride to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, we experienced the same inhumane treatment. One pail in the corner of the car, no food or water was distributed. Many of the women fell down and never got up again from sheer exhaustion, malnutrition, and the lack of will to continue and endure the atrocious behavior demonstrated toward us by the Nazis. After two days on the train, we arrived in uh, uh, Bydgoszcz, uh, which is Polish for, for Bydgoszcz. Bydgoszcz is located in northwest Poland on the Berda uh, and uh, Vistula rivers. The corpses were left behind on the train. Those who still had some strength jumped off onto the platform. Jewish men dressed in their striped uniforms held wheelbarrows. We knew the purpose of, of these one-wheeled vehicles to pile the dead bodies into them and to throw them into a communal burial pit. Who was going to recite the Kaddish, the mourner's prayer for them? From all sides, the echoes of shots were heard. We were surrounded by the SS German soldiers. In one hand, each held a revolver, while the other hand pulled back the leash of a German shepherd who was ready to attack us if we made any attempt to escape. The inmates who were too slow to leave the train, found their destiny on the spot where they stood. One single shot into each person's head brought the victim down. Blood and brain tissues were sprayed across the muddy road. That scene alone was enough to motivate us, the living, to hurry to our next de destination. We marched to the shower building. The ice-cold water came down upon us, not lasting even one minute. 
we we were already privy to it from our previous experience in Auschwitz. After the swift shower, we were given striped clothing. The numbers were sewn on the left side of the top shirt. At least the the numbers were not tattooed into our skin as had, had been done to the inmates in Auschwitz. Such an act of dehumanization. Each person had to be identified by the blue ink numbers, which were seared into the inner arm instead of being called by his or her birth name. We marched to barracks, similar to the ones we had just left behind two days earlier. I took a lower wooden platform together with Henya, my aunt. And er at early dawn, we stood for the familiar appell. After the count, the SS men divided us into several groups. I was sent to work. I was sent to work to the ammunition factory. As I sat down, an older woman approached me. She explained to me how to work the monstrous machine that lay on the table. Two people had to maneuver this equipment. As time passed by, I came to understand that the women who aided me actually lived in the city of Bidgosh. She was not a prisoner. Apparently, the German commanders hired local skilled workers. Can you imagine what I produced? Ammunition. These bullets would end the life of my brethren. Did I have a choice? I had to survive. For more than a week while I worked on the machine, my eyes filled with tears as I thought of the results of these killing instruments. I had to avoid showing any kind of emotion. Otherwise, one of the bullets would end my own life. I was able to continue and work on the machine despite the emotional pain I suffered. I passed all obstacles with the help of the Polish woman who came to my aid whenever I needed it. That Polish woman was an angel to me, not only with the work which she helped me with, but also in what she saved me, in that she saved me from starvation. Every so often she sneaked a sandwich into my bucket. She was one of the very few people who cared. Unfortunately, later on in life, I learned while reading uh, the Yitzkor, uh, a memorial book of my late husband's city, he was born in Poland, when survivors of the Holocaust returned to their birth city, um, Zioloshitz in Polish, uh, the Polish people murdered them. After three months, my job was changed. Since I was the youngest in my group of inmates, I was sent to clean up a building that was about to be filled with new arrivals. The building was located next to a brook, which separated our camp from the men's camp across from us. The prisoners wore different clothing, not striped. One day, as I approached the running water to fill up the bucket, I noticed that a piece of paper was sticking out from under one of the stones. I pulled it out and saw that there were some lines written on it. The language was foreign to me. I was eager to decipher the writing. In the evening after the appeal, I showed the note to one of our learned women. She immediately told me that the letter was written in French. My friend translated it. The writer of the French note was a French prisoner of war. He wrote that for several days he had watched me uh, from across the brook. He observed that I was very young and never stopped to eat anything. Ha, eat, I thought. Did we have any normal human food? One piece of dry black bread? I would not have fed my cows such stale food. The soldier wanted more information about me and wanted to know how he could help. Some of the information I gave was jotted down on the same note. The following day, with great apprehension, I hid my fan's letter under the same rock where I found it the previous day, from the next day until Christmas. I had a second angel looking after me. Almost every day I found small bundles of food, a sandwich, fruit, or a piece of chocolate. What a luxury to have such delicacies in such an inhuman, atrocious place to live, not even fit for an animal. Every day from that day on, I behaved like a toddler, eager to get attention or to get a new toy. I was looking forward to the small packages, curious about what was hidden inside them. At the same time, I was grateful to Hashem and to the young, beautiful soul who had helped me survive the hardships in camp. That Frenchman, despite the fact that he was a prisoner under the Germans, did not enter a stage of melancholy, but instead sought to help the needy. Cold days approached. The blowing, freezing wind penetrated through our thin, striped clothing. We shivered, trying to rub our palms together until they turned red. We jumped and ran in place when we were in the barracks. Hashem forbid if we would have done any of these acts of survival while standing for appeal, 
you know what would have resulted, death on the spot. Many of the prisoners fell on the ground from lack of strength and from the inability to endure the unbearable weather. Hashem continued to watch over me in December 1944. My job with seven other women prisoners was to fill up our buckets with wood to feed the hearth in a large house. The chimney had to produce heat in one of the dwellings owned by a German woman. We piled the wood in one of the empty rooms. This was the only time of the day that the heat warmed up my thin young body. A day before Christmas, I went down to my soldier's secret hideout of food. What I found was beyond belief, a large basket of various delicatessen edibles. I was full of joy for such presents, but on the other hand, I had become anxious. How was I going to carry such a big basket through the camp without being caught? I, if found with such a bundle in my hand, I would be shot in an instant. I immediately concealed the treasures at the bottom of my bucket. Slowly, I eased my way on the line, pretending to carry a lot of wood as the inmates before me entered the house. I picked up my feet and ran as quickly as possible into the barracks. I felt as if I had grown wings and lived up to my name, Sephora or Bird. Upon arrival at our nebek, our pitiful accommodations, I hid the food under the thin blanket and lay on the wooden platform. When my colleagues returned from their day of slavery, I divided the goodies among them. We, ne we nearly had forgotten what proper food tasted like. The following day, the authorities celebrated the holiday uh, of uh, Christians. My inmates and I celebrated a different holiday, the Feast of Purim. During this holiday, which comes a month before Peshach, Queen Esther of Persia had ordered that portions of ready-made food be given to at least two friends. Well, I shared the full basket of nourishment with 15 friends. We gorged ourselves on the varieties of food the dear French soldier had put in the straw basket. That Gentile person had pity on me. I am sure he risked his life by feeding me almost every day. He is one of the righteous souls who dared to put his life in danger for a young Jewess, a child who turned into a lioness before her time and not by her choice. Unfortunately, I found out later that he was killed in one of the resi resistance actions against the Nazis. As long as Hashem bestows life on me, I will never forget this uh, Gut uh, Neshum, this kind soul. My angel who helped me survive the starvation in camp. May his soul rest in peace. During the uh, Christ Christmas holidays, the soldiers, the generals, the captains, the women, and the rest of the German authorities ceased the load of work, none of them were able to supervise us properly all through the nights. We heard music blasting through the walls, singing and dancing went on until the small hours of nights. Much drinking of wine and beer took place. We, the prisoners, were relieved from work during this period of time. We caught up with some needed sleep. Our bones started to heal somewhat from the cessation of work for a few days. One morning after the New Year celebration, at the beginning of 1945, the German women guards howled as if their beloved herd were being put to death. They did not stop with their commands. Uh, Rus, Rus, schnell, schnell. We're haben uh, kein Zeit. Uh, we do not have any time. Here were the familiar words from long ago from our home in Ruskova. We didn't understand the sudden haste. None of the guards expected us to stand for an appel. They used their hands instead of the brown wooden rods to line us up as uh, we did. We did as we were told. They all looked like lunatics. Their hair was disheveled. Their uniforms were crooked. The infamous black dogs did not scamper around. What was going on? None of the prisoners knew we were marched out of camp. Here we go again. Thoughts crossed my mind. Where are they moving us to? Which other camp was waiting, awaiting us? Is the next place going to be as hideous as Bidgosh or better? And then she's got a couple more recipes at the end of every chapter. Kashavarnikis, buckwheat and bow tie noodles. Interesting. And uh, one is a mixture with uh, uh, nuts. Haroset. Chapter 8, They Were Silent. 
From heaven, Hashem gazed down upon mankind. Everyone has gone astray. Together they have become depraved. There is no doer of good. There is not even one. Not but vanity are common men. Were they lifted up on the scales, together they would be lighter than vanity. Hashem, you deliver us like sheep to be eaten and have scattered us among the nations. You make us a disgrace to our own neighbors, the mockery and scorn of those around us. Hashem, how numerous are my tormentors, the the great rise up against me. Foreigners lie to me. I am a worm and not a man, scorn of humanity, despised of nations. For innumerable evils have encircled me. Let all my foes be ashamed. They, the wicked, are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Have mercy on me, Hashem. See my afflictions by my foes. Germany started the First World War and had to pay dearly, according to the Treaty of Versailles, in money and land. Adolf Hitler took part in the war in 1919. At the end of the war, he became part of the German Workers' Party to be changed to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis. That particular party was a race-based organization. On November 8, 1923, Hitler, with his stormtroopers, the SA uh, Sturmabteilung, surrounded a group of government officials in Munich. He wanted to overthrow the government. He gave them the option of joining his revolution. The officials initially agreed, but then turned him over to the authorities. Hitler stood trial and was convicted of high treason. In April 1924, he was sentenced to five years in prison. He served only nine months. While in prison, he dictated to his deputy, Rudolf Heiss, the first volume of his book, Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. Hitler had two main ideologies. Since Germany had lost 13% of its land as a result of the Versailles Agreement, he stressed to the German people as well as to the Allies in 1939 that all Germans needed was to be united. He called that uh, uh, Lebensraum, or living space. Unfortunately, he succeeded with his propaganda beyond all imagination and with very little opposition from the Allies. On March 12, 1938, Hitler annexed Austria, on October 1st, 1938, Germany occupied uh, Sudetenland. On, then on March 15th, 1939, Hitler proclaimed Bohemia and Moravia as part of Germany. Hitler's second ideology was to have a pure Aryan nation. What was done is, again, beyond human comprehension. Since Germany had to pay a large sum of money as reparation because of the First World War, many people were out of work. The economy was very weak. Germany had to take out loans from the United States of America in 1929. When the American stock market crashed, everyone suffered. Germany's uh, inhabitants, as well as the Americans, all the loans were called off. Hitler had combined the ideas of having a pure Aryan race with his hatred toward the Jews, the Nuremberg Laws, which were issued in 1935. That stated that no Jewish person was allowed to be married to a German. Jews were not permitted to hold any position in any businesses. Lawyers, doctors, artists, actors, and journalists all had to resign from their posts. In addition, Jews couldn't attend the German public schools and not its universities. On May 10, 1933, all books written by Jewish authors or those who were liberals or communists were burned. Authors such as uh, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, Ernest Hemingway, Thomas Mann, and hundreds more were banned. 12,400 titles were blacklisted and removed from the libraries and bookstores. 2,500 writers escaped Germany after the first burning, book burning. Such were the beginning steps of purifying the Aryan blood and mind. Heinrich Hein, a German-Jewish poet and a journalist who lived during the 19th century, said, Where books are burned, in the end, men will burn as well. Unfortunately, Heinz's prophecy came into fruition. The people of Germany benefited from all all of the cleansing actions ordered by the dictatorship of Adolf Hitler's regime. Anything that was taken away from the Jews was given to the pure German race. Houses, land, jobs, and clothing, gold, silver, money, and master artworks were shipped to Berlin. 
In addition, religious artifacts and Torah scrolls were stolen from the Hungarian Jewish synagogues. Did anyone raise a voice of objection or protest? Of course not. Anti-Semitism was spread through lies and propaganda, which were broadcasted on on the radio many hours a day. Rallies were held in secrets, all organized and well-maintained. Everyone had to attend and listen to, to the words of hatred or inspiration. Such was the dictatorship of Hitler. As one scholar, Abarak Lori, said, dictatorship will succeed if you have a scapegoat and must have hate. The Jews were the scapegoat. Images of Jews depicted them as evil worms, rats, and devils. It was the propaganda way to divert the people's attention from the real problem of the country. From 1939 until 41, the Nazi regime opened the German borders for the Jews to leave the country. Those who were able to pay for their voyage wanted to stay in Europe. They were hoping that eventually they could return to Germany, their homeland. Unfortunately, many countries shut their doors and did not issue visas for the refugees. That indicated that included the United States of America. As one philosopher, Hannah Arendt, said, the refugees were welcome nowhere and could be assimilated nowhere. Once they left their homeland, they remained homeless. Latin America opened its borders. The Jews who were able to pay for new places in Latin American countries left Europe between the years of 1933 and 42. The following countries opened their borders for the Jewish immigrants. During the 30s, the Jews who settled in the capital of Costa Rica were from Poland. In 1933, the first Orthodox synagogue, Shari Zion, was built. During the years 1933 through 1943, the population of Jews was 2,700 in Ecuador. Most of the Jews came from Germany. Early in the year 1936, some Jewish refugees found home in Brazil and Panama. In Guatemala, the number of Jews has increased to 9,000 since the Second World War. Today, the Jewish community is a mixture of Orthodox Jews, Sephardic from Spain, Eastern European, and Germans. The first Jew to settle in Haiti in 1942 was Louis Torres, who was Christopher Columbus's um, interpreter. In 1937, Haiti's government issued passports and visas to Eastern Eastern European Jews. From the 16th century until the Nazi regime, there was immigration to Mexico. Currently, there are 50,000 Jews in this country. Between 1933 and 39, 15,000 to 20,000 Jews settled in Paraguay, escaping the Nazi government. During the Second World War, many Jews from the Netherlands and other parts of Europe came to live in Suriname. Uh, Today, there are 2,765 Jews. By 1943, nearly 600 German Jews had entered Venezuela. There was a well-established Jewish community which reached the number of more than 35,000. Unfortunately, the population of Jews had decreased in staggering amounts as a result of anti-Semitic attacks for the past 12 years. The father of the current president, Nicolas Maduro, uh, was of Sephardic Jewish descent. The Evian Conference, and we mentioned this before. Hello, Melissa Clark and Ashley G. Nice to have you with us. President Franklin D. Roosevelt called for an international conference. The meeting took place in evian le France, near the Swiss border from July 6, 14, 1938. F.D. Roosevelt was pressured at home in the United States of America by the Jewish groups to deal with the Jewish refugees. He sent his close friend Myron C. Taylor, a businessman who quoted the president, no country would be expected to receive a greater number of immigrants than is permitted by its existing legislation. The delegates from 32 countries took advantage of the statement that each country could not open their borders to the German refugees. The United States held on to that statement as well. The only country to open its doors was the Dominican Republic. She was willing to accept 100,000 refugees in return for payment of millions of dollars. This huge amount of money was given by the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. In May 1940, 500 settlers came to the city of Susa. 
As a result of the Evian Conference, Hitler stated, nobody wants these criminals. The St. James Palace Conference. On February 7, 1939, a London conference took place at St. James Palace, London. The issue was the partition of Palestine, the state of Israel today. The British government called for the meeting to plan the future government of Palestine and end and the end of the British mandate in that, the region. The Arab res, representative, Al Husseini, the, the Mufti of Jerusalem, a, proto, a pro-Nazi who collaborated with Hitler to build concentration camps in the Middle East, refused to sit at one table with the Jewish leaders. The representative of the opposite side was Chaim Weissman, the scientist who became the first president of Israel. Second in position to the Prime Minister ben, David Ben-Gurion in 1948, Sir Malcolm MacDonald, the British colonial secretary, notified the groups that if no solution was reached, the British would propose one, hence the white paper. The Jews, could the Jews have been saved from the Germans, the, the Nazis? As a result of this document, the, the illegal immigration increased. Two Jewish groups who were active in Palestine during the British mandate, uh, the Haganah, the Defense, and uh, Etzel, the National Military Organization, helped to bring in as many Jews as possible before they were gassed by the Nazis. The White Paper. The British government, under the leadership of Prime Minister uh, Neville Chamberlain, and with help of Sir, MacDonald, Sir Malcolm MacDonald, issued a proclamation that a limit of 75,000 immigrants would be allowed to enter Palestine, all with visas. Alas, the number had to be spread throughout five years from the time of its issue, 1940 to 44. There were also restrictions on purchasing land in Palestine. On May 23, 1939, the House of Commons approved the White Paper by a vote of 268 to 179. The United States Reaction America stayed silent. The country needed to survive the strains of the Depression. Nonetheless, during a cabinet meeting on April 18, 1933, Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins proposed an executive order regarding the refugees. She suggested giving priority to racial and religious persecution. The State Department objected. The immigrants would take the place of jobless Americans. 11 million were still unemployed. In 1933, James Grover MacDonald was assigned by the League of Nations to run the High Commission for Refugees, Jews and non-Jews alike. He traveled to Berlin during Hitler's first months of power. MacDonald gave President Roosevelt a first-hand account of the Nazis' violence against the Jews. MacDonald inferred after the meeting in the White House that the President and his administration would not publicly reprimand Germany. As a result, MacDonald resigned his post on December 27, 1935. In 1948, he became the first United States ambassador to Israel. Beginning in 1935, Edward R. Morrow was a well-known American war correspondent with CBS Radio. Morrow reported on the Germans' actions all over Europe. In 1939, he hired the journalist William L. Schreier. Uh, he made his last report from London in March 1946. In February 1939, two representatives of Congress introduced the Wagner-Rogers Bill. Robert F. Wagner, born in Prussia, had a German background and was a New York Democratic senator. Edith Nurse Rogers was a Democrat from Massachusetts. The bill called for admitting 23,000 German Jewish children to the United States of America. Former President Herbert Hoover endorsed the bill. However, President Roosevelt was following public opinion, and most Americans opposed this immigration. The Senate and House subcommittees voted unanimously in favor of the bill. When it reached the House Immigration Committee, however, the bill was killed. In July 1940, the German Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe the Air Force, attacked Britain. In August 1940, the Congress of the United States passed a law that allowed thousands of British children to enter the country. Beyond the immigra immigration quotas, the American public widely supported the bill. President Roosevelt called these children visitors, meaning one day they would return to their homeland, England. 
Concurrently, 400 Jews sick with bloody diarrhea in the labor camp, uh, Josephow, Poland, were executed. On June 26, 1940, United States Assistant Secretary of State uh, Breckenridge Long sought to prevent any Jewish entry. He ordered the American consuls to put every obstacle in the way to postpone and continue to postpone the granting of visas. Mr. Long succeeded with his mission of hatred toward the Jews for the next four years. Historians called Mr. Long's actions erecting a paper wall. In 1942, Britain and the United States decided to ship food to Greece after the Germans agreed to the distribution. There was great starvation in that country. 35 tons of cartons filled with food were sent to the Greeks. That amount was shipped each month. Every year, $30 million was spent by the Allies to save the people of Greece. In Europe, millions of Jews were famished to death. Did anyone save them? In 1942, Switzerland forced 10,000 Jews, mostly from France, to go back to their land. Occupied by the Germans, the Swiss claimed that only political refugees could be admitted. However, they gladly accepted the gold, which the Germans extracted from the mouths and fingers of the millions of dead Jews. On January 13, 1944, two United States Treasury officials, Josiah Dubois Jr., a lawyer, and Randolph Paul, his superior, warned the de department about their resignation. They threatened to go public about the facts they had about the Nazi atrocities against the Jews. The two presented a letter to the Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, Jr. The major point of it stated, of the acquiescence of this government on the murder of the Jews and the failure to act and prevent action to rescue them. Morgenthau, a Jew, brought the report to President Roosevelt. Subsequently, two major actions were taken. 200,000 Jewish refugees were permitted to enter the United States toward the closing months of the war and the War Refugee Board was established. Morgenthau he headed the board. The task was to save as many Jews as possible from 1944 until the end of the war. John uh, Pell Jr., uh, who took over the board after Morgenthau, said it was too late, little and late. On June 9, 1944, a 1,000 refugees were placed in Fort Ontario, Oswego, which was an army facility in New York State. 989 came to find refuge from 17 countries. Most of the refugees were Jews. They were given a place of sanctuary on the condition that they returned to their homeland at the end of the war. Eleanor Roosevelt was quoted as saying, Congress acts in the way people at home want them to act. In December 1945, President Harry Truman allowed the refugees to stay in the United States of America. The camp closed in February 1946. Um, uh, Chiun Sugihara. On December 6, 1938, five Japanese minister, ministers' councils, among them the Prime Minister Fumi, Fumimaro uh, Kono, made a decision prohibit the expulsion of the Jews from Japan despite the fact that Japan was part of the Axis and Germany was urging Japan to issue anti-Semitic laws. During the Second World War, Japan was regarded as a safe refuge from the hand of Germany's killing machine. In order to reach Japan, the route the Jews had to use was through the neutral country of Lithuania. In March 1939, Council General uh, Chiun Sugihara was sent by the Japanese government to the city of Kanas, uh, then the temporary capital of Lithuania. It was situated between Germany and the USSR. During the year of 1940, the German, Germans advanced to Eastern Europe. In July, the Soviet Union annexed Lithuania, and <laughs> the Russian government introduced all cons consulates to leave the capital city. Only Mr. John Zwardendiek, uh, the acting Dutch consul in, in Chiyun uh, Sugihara remained in Kanas. The Polish Jewish refugees found out that two Dutch colonial islands, Karaka, Kara, Karaso, and uh, Dutch Guiana, today known as Suriname, 
situated in the Caribbean did not ask for visas from those who wanted to settle there. The acting Dutch consul notified the refugees that it would suffice to stamp their passports to enter the islands. However, in order to get to the Caribbean, the immigrants had to pass through the Soviet Union, then through Japan. The Soviet consul agreed on one condition. Japan had to issue the transit visas. Thousands of Jewish immigrants emigrants gathered outside the consulate. Mr. Sugihara wired the Japanese government to receive permission to issue the visas. The reply was negative. Even after the third try, Mr. Sugihara and his family decided to help the refugees on their own. For 29 days, day and night, from July 31st until August 28th, 1940, they wrote and signed visas for thousands of Jewish refugees. As a result of Mr. and Mrs. Sugihara's intervention to save the Jews of Poland, Germany, and Austria, the refugees arrived at the city of Kobe, Japan. 2,185 remain in the city. By the order of the Japanese government, many were moved to Shanghai, China, which was under the Japanese occupation. The government designated a certain amount of the city land, which became known as the Shanghai Ghetto. Among those who were saved were the leaders and students of Mir Yeshiva, a Jewish school in Lithuania. It remained in, Lith- it remained Lithuania, in Lithuania until August 3rd, 1940. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, that Mir Yeshiva school is... Uh, branched and developed one in New York City, which is where Tovia Singer uh, has uh, attended, and Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem as well, where my friend uh, Rabbi Pinhas Levin uh, taught for a number of years. Um, it remained in Lithuania until August 3rd, 1940. This was apparently the only uh, remaining Yeshiva from before the war. Uh, when this country was annexed to Belarus, Republic of the USSR under the Soviet rule. Uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, Israel, gathered testimonies from all over the world about the extraordinary courage of Mr. and Mrs. Sugihara. In 1985, Mr. Chiun Sugihara was recognized as a righteous among the nations. A park in Jerusalem was named after him. He was asked why he helped 6,000 refugees. He said they were human beings and they needed help. Germany invaded the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941. On August 16, 1942, the Germans murdered the entire Jewish population in Mir. 200 Jews managed to escape and joined the, 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 the partisans in the forest. In 1942, the London re- press reported that all the Jews in Mariupol Ukraine had been killed. Uh, Sven Norman. Sven Norman, born in 1892, was the head of the Swedish engineering company AASEA in Warsaw, Poland, during the German invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. On May 1st, 1942, Sven Norman took a suitcase with a hidden compartment. The valise contained documents detailing the slaughter of 700,000 Jews. There were also 2,000 photographic negatives of the Nazi atrocities. Norman was one of the seven Swedish men who came to London with a dossier of photographs and documents to show and tell the world of the Nazi persecution of the Polish Jew, Jews. That was the first smuggled proof of the inhumanity that took place under the German Nazi regime. The BBC on June 9, 1942 broadcast the Nazi atrocities. At this time, the Allies knew about the annihilation of the Jews that took place in Poland. Did anyone stop the German army? The exiled government. Władysław Sikorowski, Poland's prime minister in exile, resided in London. He revealed that 700,000 Jews had been systematically killed by the Nazis. He added that there were concentration camps and executions in mass graves, ghettos were established, and the gas chambers were in, in uh, perfidious use. The Prime Minister addressed the wartime allies, which were then known as the United Nations. He presented a document titled, The Mass Extermination of Jews in German-Occupied Poland. The existence of all the atrocities committed by the Nazis against the Polish Jews was validated. Crazy.
Dr. Gerhard Reigner's report. In May 1942, Dr. Gerhard Reigner, the World Jewish Congress representative in Switzerland, received a report from an underground member of the Socialist Bund, the Jewish Labor Union, in the Warsaw Ghetto named Shmuel uh, Zigil Boj, Bojum. The report was smuggled into London. It indicated that 700,000 Jews had been murdered by the Nazis. On June 22, 42, Mr. Zig, Zigelbaum broadcast on the BBC the atrocities committed against the Jews by the Nazis in Poland. He also gave the information to the Daily Telegraph and other British newspapers. On July 30, 1942, a German industrialist, Edward uh, Schulte, whose company had mines near the death camp Auschwitz, revealed to a Swiss colleague that Hitler had decided to kill all the Jews starting in the fall of 1942. The method of killing was to be the use of Prusik acid, known as Cyclone B. Uh, that was Hitler's final solution. This information reached Dr. Ragnar on August 1st, 1942. Dr. Ragnar met with uh, Howard uh, Elting, the vice consul of the United States consulate in Geneva. He briefed him on what had been told regarding the final solution. Ragnar asked that the cable be sent to Rabbi Weiss in New York of the World Jewish Congress. When he visited the British diplomat, he requested that the same message be sent to both the British World Jewish Congress official and to Rabbi Weiss. A telegram with this information was sent to the State Department of the United States. The cable indicated Hitler's plan to annihilate all the Jews of Nazi-occupied countries. On August 28, 1942, Rabbi Stephen S. Weiss received the information from Samuel Silverman, a Jewish member of the English Parliament. He took the telegram to the United States Undersecretary of State, uh, Summer Wells, Sumner Wells, and in return, the latter asked the rabbi not to publicize the information until it could be verified. In late November, Weiss, Wells called Rabbi Weiss to tell him that Regner's report had been validated. The validation was given to Edward Schulte, head of a large German company that dealt with the German military. He was an anti-Nazi and decided to pass on the bitter news. On November 24, 1942, Rabbi Weiss called for the American press, called for the American press. The rabbi stated that the United States Department had confirmed the slaughter of millions of Jews under the Nazi regime. On December 7, 1942, Robert Borden, a United States State Department official who was considered an expert on Jewish matters in Europe, advised the government to remain silent concerning the mass execution of Jews. The following day, on December 8, 1942, Rabbi Weiss, along with other Jewish leaders, met with President Roosevelt to discuss the fate of the European Jews. The president expressed sympathy for the losses of the Jewish people, adding, we are doing everything possible to, de to determine who are personally guilty. Reaction of 11 countries. On December 17, 1942, 11 governments of the free world issued a joint statement which appeared in the New York Times the following day. They condemned the extermination of the European Jews and promote, promised to prosecute the German authorities. On March 1, 1943, a rally took place in Madison Square Gardens, New York City. The slogan was, Stop Hitler Now. 75,000 Jews attended the gathering. 55,000 had to stay on the streets. Jewish leaders, as well as non-Jews, spoke during the gathering. The main point was to help the Jews in Europe. Was anything done? Now that the world knew about the genocide that knew about the genocide that was taking place all over Europe, did any of the Allies use any of their means to help the innocents? On May 12, 1943, Shmuel uh, Ziegelbaum committed suicide. He was the one who had passed the information about the annihilation that was taking place in Poland. He took his Life as a result of the acquiescence the Allied governments demonstrated and the lack of action against the Nazis. In 1961, with the help of his surviving son, Tuvia, Mr. Ziegelbaum's ashes were buried in Mount Carmel Cemetery on Long Island. Witold uh, Pilecki. Captain Witold Pilecki, a Catholic Polish officer, 
had deliberately arranged to be arrested by the SS and be transported to Auschwitz in 1940. In 1943, Pilecki wrote his first report on Auschwitz as an alert for the outside world to find out what really was happening in the camp. Captain uh, Pilecki was an eyewitness to the atrocities that took place, place in the death camp, Auschwitz, beginning in September 1940. After his arrest in April 1943 through a well-planned route, Pilecki and another inmate escaped Auschwitz. In early 1942, the mass execution of Jews, the final solution, had begun. The author, uh, Jarek Garlinski, who translated Pilecki's original report, wrote about the captain who had enough strength resilience and courage to help others and to build an underground resistance organization within the camp under the watchful eyes of the Nazis. Initially, the camp was established to imprison Christian political Poles. The captain's organization sent a number of reports to the Polish government in exile in London. That was done by way of the Polish Home Army, AK, which stood for um, Armia uh, Krajow in Polish. The reports were about the conditions in the camp and the gassing of mass numbers of Jews. At the time of Captain uh, Pilecki's escape from Auschwitz, over one million Jews were murdered. Early in 1944, no one in Roosevelt's cabinet asked for a military operation to rescue the inmates, mostly Jews in the concentration camps and labor camps. Oh, and then she's got a couple more recipes, one for barley soup and... uh, uh, one for a, a, a salad. All right, chapter nine, liberation. Hashem is my rock and my fortress. He saved me from my mighty foe and from my enemies, for they overpowered me. Hashem was my support. He brought me out into broad spaces. Though I walk in the valley overshadowed by death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. We were herded into the midst of a huge field. For a moment, it looked as if we were in complete isolation, disconnected from the world. As we looked around us and squinted harder into the distance, we saw lights flickering from afar. Suddenly, the German female guards ripped off their clothing and quickly changed into civilian apparel. They dug a large hole in the ground and buried their military uniforms in a hurry. The newly clad women uh, vanished as if Blowing wind had swept them away. They abandoned us. Whoa, are we free? Finally, we exclaimed and looked at each other with bewildered expressions. This morning we were slaves and now we are free, called out one of the girls who ascended, who assessed the situation. The story of Passover came to mind only without the splitting of the Red Sea. We were exhilarated by the idea of being free again. We jumped up and down like kids who had gotten our first presents of the year. We laughed, we cried, and we hugged each other, tears of joy streaming down our faces. Despite this moment of triumph, the strong cold wind incited us to move on, to take care of our scrawny bodies clothed in thin layers. The spiritual part got its fulfillment for the moment. We had to continue and think about the future. The light snowflakes turned into a blizzard. We had to deal with the fact that a shelter had to be found in the very near future before we would turn into pillars of snow. We eyed a house that stood far apart from any other structures. We watched for any signs of anyone coming or going. We needed to know whether the house was occupied. Some of us hid behind thick tree trunks. Others lowered themselves to the ground among the tall stalks in the field. After an hour or so, with watching finger with aching fingertips and almost frozen toes, we approached the house cautiously. It seemed vacant. We tiptoed into the house, going through the side entrance, which led to the kitchen. From the look of the piled-up dishes in the sink and the clothing scattered all over the counters and floor, it was obvious that the previous occupants had left their dwelling in a hurry. Our first action was to attend to our physical needs. All 15 of us women rummaged through the closets. We needed warm clothing. The sizes did not matter. We had grown accustomed to ill-fitting garments from Auschwitz and, and, and Bidgosh. It was such a great pleasure to feel the woolen sweaters against our cold skin. We gathered wood and placed it in the hearth. The warmth of the fire engulfed me. I was able to move my almost frozen bones with ease. We all, uh, we all shep notches or, or derived pleasure from the heat that filled the room. 
With dreamy eyes, we gazed into the red rising flames. After an hour of enjoyable warmth, we each were able to hear our stomach's juices working themselves into a frenzy. We were famished. Two women reminded us that when we entered the house, there had been a large chicken coop in the yard. Three women went out to fetch four chickens. One young woman claimed that she was the daughter of a, a Sokik, a religious Jewish the religious, the Jewish religious laws dictate that shita or kosher slaughtering must be performed on the cattle and fowl. The shita took place in the yard after we found a sharp knife among the kitchen utensils. Immediately, three members of our group volunteered to pluck the feathers. Others set up pots of water, measured some seasoning, and cut up the chicken into eighths. We waited pa imp impatiently for the pa plain water to turn to into a healing chicken soup flooded with a lot of meat. I recalled that whenever we were plagued with a cold back home, Mama used to feed us the penicillin soup. It cured all ailments. After we completed devouring the large three pots of soup and the chicken, we were revived as if a new life had been ushered into our bodies. It was indeed reviving. We licked our plates and our fingers. We did not leave even one small piece. Even the bones were taken care of chewing on them and sucking out the liquid, enjoying the meal reminded us of Passover chicken soup. The last time we had eaten it at home before we were herded out to the unknown. We cleaned up the dishes. Suddenly banging came from the front door. Here we go again. This, this fearful thought crossed my mind. Couldn't we enjoy a little peace for a little while longer? The woman we had designated as watchdog opened the door with the greatest trepidation. She had seen men in white uniforms swarming the area. We opened the door slightly. One of the men said we had to evacuate the house and move away from the city. They were part of the USSR army, and they were planning to bomb the city. The Allies were overcoming the Axis army. One of our women spoke Russian and translated every word to us. We expressed our gratitude to the soldiers, each one of us, gathered some essential items, packed them, and moved out into the cold weather awaiting us. Our journey was a long one. We were in the northern part of Poland. Our destination was the center of Romania, for me, Ruskova. We walked as one entity, a small group of women. We were determined to reach our homes, no matter what obstacles would we would encounter on our way. The past nine months of hell had turned us into resilient group. Each of us contributed her own strong character. We knew the importance of never separating from each other and not going anywhere unaccompanied. The Russian soldiers had been engaged in the fight against the Germans since 1941. They were predators. They looked for curves. Uh, they looked for harlots. Uh, as a united group, we were able to force away all new challenges. Uh, we drew on each other's will to live and extraordinary strength. After a treacherous walk of two hours in the hard, slippery snow and some slushy, unpaved roads, which made it very difficult to go anywhere in haste, we reached an open barn. We entered the wooden shelter, which was filled with hay. At least we will be protected from the cold open air, I thought to myself. I am sure the others had the same idea. We found a soft, sinking seat on the hay, uh, there were some bundles tied up together, which formed a place to lay down and stretch our aching feet. It didn't take long before we heard loud voices approaching our hideout. Two women, a mother and her daughter, quickly jumped into a high bale of hay and hid underneath. Soldiers burst through the barn door. It almost came off its hinges. The force was immensely strong. They mumbled something among themselves, which I didn't understand. I watched their movements. They took a pitchfork, which leaned against the wall, and proceeded quickly toward the hay that was piled up high and stabbed into it with great force. I heard screams, cries, groans, then silence. The two women who were family lived through the inhumane treatment in the labor camps, and not this. They were killed by the Allied army. We were dumbfounded. We looked on with bewildered eyes. All of us were in a state of shock. I felt a great ache in my heart. Just as when my family had been taken away, I stood there as if I were glued to the ground and stared at the blood, which streamed down from underneath the pile of hay. Slowly it ran by me, barely touching my feet. 
I felt cold, so cold, as if a ball of ice were sliding down my shirt. I shook from top to bottom as if north wind had just blown into the barn. It took us approximately 10 minutes to understand what had taken place. Then all hell broke loose. Some yelled, others howled. A few could not utter a word. Oh, no, such cruelty. Absolutely, the behavior is inhuman. Didn't we have enough of these subhuman deaths? When is all of this devastating uh, death going to end? Such were the cries of pain, I recall, from this unfortunate day. The soldiers didn't give us a second thought. Obvious to our, oblivious to our sorrow and pain, they just told us to continue on our way. For our safety, we had to leave Poland. Some of us said a prayer for the two deceased women. We left the macabre place with the thoughts of a brighter future. We had to, despite our heavy hearts. Ben mak trak gut vet zan gut. When one thinks positive thoughts, all will be good. We trod heavily on for a few hours. Thank God we had warm layers of clothing now to shield us from the cold wind. We had, how had we survived six months of cold, freezing weather when the wind penetrated through our thin layers of clothing? Resilience, I guess. <laughs> the long walk toward the south of the country reminded us that we needed to find some food. We did not have any of the country's currency. What could we do to obtain something to sustain us until the next city? We reached an urban area. From the place where we stood, I saw a small grocery store. I motioned uh, to the woman next to me. We approached the place. My friend pushed the door open a crack. The hinges were badly in need of lubrication. We feared opening the door wider, but the scent of the various cheeses that were displayed on the shelves uh, banished all worries. We reached the shelf, stretched out our hands to grab some of the treasures before us, but instead of that joy, instead of the joy that filled our hearts, we were struck on the back of the shoulders and were pulled to the center of the store. Two soldiers whom we recognized from their uniforms spoke their unclear words to us. We spoke to them in our native language, Romanian. Uh, we have tried Hungarian, but to no avail. They pointed their guns towards the door. We understood we had to move on. We were reluctant to follow these men in uniform. We cried, shouted, declared our innocence. Uh, nothing helped. We practically were dragged to the nearest police station. Can you imagine from one prison to the next? Will we ever see some light and hope for the future on our way back to life? We did not cease our screams and cries. We talked until our voices sounded like the fog on early morning visits. We continued this behavior in the hope of arousing some th sympathy. After one hour when we could hardly utter another sound, a tall, blonde, blue-eyed man came marching in, decorated with colorful medals. It was obvious he was the captain. The first words that came out of his mouth were in Hungarian. It was a great relief. We spoke again, the more calmly this time. Uh, we explained to the commander where we had come from. We told about our experiences in Bidgosh, the labor camp. We saw the tears that threatened to drown his face. He held them back, as is a gross shand far aman zum vayan. For a man to cry is a great shame. The captain and the other soldiers sympathized with this. He added that he could not envision the calamity that had happened to the Jews and the other group of people. They offered us packages of food to carry back to our friends. <clears throat> they had some uh, Rachmones pity on us. We thanked our saviors and wished them well with the fighting. We crossed city after city. The effects of the war were visible everywhere. Many buildings, public, municipal, and private, were destroyed or partially bombed. Many stores were boarded up. Bodies of young and old were scattered along the side of the roads. Some were covered with a torn blanket and some with a rag. They were ready for burial, but no one buried them. If it had been summer, only bones would have been found. The vultures would have had a feast. Shots were heard coming from every corner of the streets. There was heavy smoke from the artillery fired from the guns and the monstrous tanks which were rolling down the unpaved roads. The soldiers trod behind the tanks carrying their rifles and heavy backpacks. Uh, were they able to tolerate the deafening noise coming from the large vehicles? Well, they had to. 
The Allies had to defeat the villainous men of the Nazi regime, no matter what. In order to avoid being killed by the flying bullets or splashed with wet, dirty soil, we had to walk carefully and close to the bombed houses. Despite the harsh roads and the freezing cold weather and the lack of food, we were determined to reach our destinations. We could not pay to ride on the train, the city one, of course, so we rode on top of it. Can you believe such daredevils we were? When one has nothing, he has to find a solution. There were times we used an open wagon. Anything with wheels would have been helpful. We just needed to reach our hometowns. Why? Why go back to a place that had spit in our faces? What did I expect to find in my hometown? Well, perhaps some other relatives, ones who were able to escape the death camps, were still alive. I could not believe that all the members of the Drottler, uh, Schachter, Pearl, and Younger families had all perished, killed off by the Nazis. Uh, Yamak Shemaim, let their name be erased. Uh, it took us nearly three months until the middle of March 1945 to reach my shtetl. I searched for my house on the way. I saw that some of the houses had been vandalized, some burned down, while others stood partially erect. Finally, I stood in front of my house, my birthplace. Tears streamed down my face. I had mixed feelings, sad because I didn't have any members of my family with me. Happy because I had survived, I had defied the enemies, the Nazis. Will I still find the scattered glass on the floor? I knocked on the door. It had a new lock. When there was no answer, I persisted with louder knocks. A tall, heavy-set man with a colorful apron tied across a heavy-set woman with a colorful apron tied across her large hips opened the door. Who are you? She asked in an arrogant tone. After a few exchanged words, she spat her venomous words at me. We thought all of you had died. She slammed the door in my face. That was some welcome. So, what is one to do? I did not give up after what I had gone through in Auschwitz and Bidgosh. No one would break my spirit ever again. The Nazis didn't, did not succeed then. No one will ever succeed now or in the future. These thoughts crossed my mind. The devastating experience of the previous nine months had turned me into a mature woman beyond my real age of 15. Before I knew it, I encountered another blow to my uh, soul, as if I hadn't already had enough. In the next village, I met close relatives. They used to live in the city of Satumare, located in the northwest region of Romania. I spent a few days with the family. Uh, Rachmiel, my cousin, whom I knew before the war, started like me to the extent that he had asked his father for my hand in marriage. His father cruelly answered, Zipper Gittel, Zihat Gornet, Zihat Nit Kain Naiden. Zipper Gittel doesn't have anything. She does not have a dowry. You cannot marry her. It was tradition that brides brought into the marriage a full household of bedding towels, dishes, and the like. If the bride's parents were well off, perhaps money would accompany the wife-to-be. What did I have in terms of valuable material? I had nothing. That was such a blow to my spirit, such a reply to come from a, a relative. After all the suffering I had gone through, such treatment felt fell upon me from my own flesh and blood. It was difficult to digest. He was not a, a simple Jew. He was a learned religious chassid, like the rest of the family members. When I realized that I had reached a plateau in, the, in this stage of my life, I also realized that I had nothing to seek in Ruskova. I resolved to embark on a new journey, to leave all the bad memories behind and venture on a new life. I got in contact with a Zionist organization. I decided it was the right time to follow in the footsteps of our forefather Abraham, the first Hebrew who left Babylon to reach the land of Canaan. Later on in my life, when I met his brother David Schachter, Zetzel of blessed memory, he was extremely furious that such unethical behavior had taken place toward a member of his family. I decided to leave Romania to go on Elia to Israel, then was still called Palestine, in June 1945. Despite the fact that I was alone, I am emulated Abraham, the first Jew who stood alone with his spiritual ideas guiding him. Being alone turned into a positive outlook upon life. I felt exhilarated and triumphant, for I had defied Adolf Hitler's wish to defeat the German 
Adolf's wish and defeated the German army. I continued that legacy. As King Solomon wrote, the crown of the elders is the children's children. Am Israel Chai, the nation of Israel lives. Hashem is good from generation to generation in his faithfulness. Oh, and then she gives a recipe for tzimis, which is sweet carrots, and uh, rot flesh, which is brisket in wine. Ooh, sounds delicious. Chapter 10, they sank. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the princes conspire secretly. Behold my foes, for they become many, and they hate me with unjustly animosity. Let them not rejoice over me, those who oppose me for false cause. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He has ceased complaining to do good. O God, transgressors have risen up against me. A company of ruthless men have sought my soul. For without cause they have hidden for me a snare for their net. Without cause they have dug pits to kill me. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed, in whose hands is conspiracy and whose right hand is full of bribery. The arrogant have hidden a snare for me and, and ropes. They spread a net near my footpath. They set traps for me. You are my help and my rescuer, my God, and do not delay. The Germans were victorious. They swept through Europe starting in 1938. Adolf Hitler began with uh, the occupation of Austria on June 22, 41. The German troops marched eastward towards Russia to destroy the communists a year after. France surrendered. In Europe, Jews had very few places to escape to. Most of the countries were under Axis occupation. The United States of America also did not open their borders. In 1924, the Johnson Immigration Act was passed. The bill set a limit to the number of immigrants who could enter America. German Jews were pla placed their names on the list between 1938 and 41. Only 123,868 Jewish refugees immigrated to the United States of America. Another way to be saved from the murderous machine under the Nazi regime was to immigrate to the Holy Land, Israel, named Palestine until May 15, 1948. In order to reach Palestine, one had to go through the Black Sea, starting in Romania. The question is, why did the Germans allow the refugees to go through Romania? There was a need for Romania's oil, and the Germans wanted uh, the Antonescu regime to side with them. At this point in the war, the marshal did not want to herd any Jew, any away any Jews. There was more profit in keeping the Jews alive rather than sending them to the ghettos or concentration camps. A wealthy Jew like uh, Baron Newman donated a billion lei, or a million Swiss francs, to the Palace of the, the, the Handicapped and many other organizations connected to the Antonescus. The chief rabbi of Romania, Alexander Saf Safran, aided the, by Swiss and Swedish ambassadors, pressured the authorities not to transport the Jews of Transylvania to Banat. The pressure caused the evacuation of the Jewish communities to be held until the spring of 1944. At his trial in 1946, Marshal Ion Antonescu, an anti-Semite, said that he be, believed that at the beginning of the Second World War, he would be able to solve the Jewish question. At the end of 1942, he imagined that the Jews could be used as capital to help improve Romania's economic situation. All the Jews had to pay dearly for their voyages and also had to pay the Romanian authorities. <coughs> The Jews who were planning to depart from Romania had to use their, the river Danube. That route led to the port city of uh, Constanta on the Black Sea. From the port city, the refugees had to reach Turkey, a neutral country during the war. The last destination was Palestine. Oh, the St. Louis. In the early stages of the war, 1939, Germany was eager to rid itself of Jewish communities. The Gestapo encouraged several shipping lines to sell visas to German Jews. Cuba was in high demand for escape. The location was far from Europe and near the United States of America. The Hamburg American line sold 907 visas to, to Jews. 
734 already had numbers on the United States quota waiting list. Each person was asked to pay an additional $150 for a landing certificate. On May 5, 1939, the president of Cuba, Brew, signed a decree making all landing certificates invalid. The Hamburg America line knew about the decree but ignored it nevertheless and did not notify the refugees. On May 3, 1939, the St. Louis sailed to Cuba. On May 27, 1939, the ship entered Havana, Cuba. The 532 passengers were not allowed to disembark. The families of the refugees tried bribery. They appealed to the authorities, but nothing helped. For days, the St. Louis made front-page headlines in the New York Times and the rest of the world's magazines and major papers. The ship sailed up and down the coast of Florida. The American Jewish Group, the Joint Distribution Committee, was willing to pay an additional $500 bond per refugee. The ship was forced to return to Hamburg, Germany. And this is all before the war really kicked in. The ship even tried to sail to Palestine. The British refused to let her enter. On the way back to Germany, France, England, Belgium, and the Netherlands each agreed to accept some passengers. These countries were paid a compensation for taking in the refugees. The payments came from the JDC. 278 refugees survived. The remaining passengers were murdered at the hands of the Nazis. The SS Kwanzaa. In 19, August 1940, the SS Kwanzaa, a Portuguese passenger cargo ship, was chartered by passengers who wanted to flee Europe. The ship left Lisbon, Portugal on August 8th. It arrived at the New York City Harbor on August 19th. 196 passengers disembarked. 66 of them were American citizens. 121 remaining ref refugees were denied entry. Nearly all were Jews. The SS Kwanzaa proceeded to Veracruz, Mexico, the ship arrived on August 3, 1940. 35 passengers were allowed to disembark. 86, mostly Belgian Jews, remained on board. The ship was ordered to return to Europe on September 11, 1940. Kwanzaa stopped for coal in Norfolk, Virginia. During the delay, Jacob Morowitz, a Jewish lawyer from Newport News, filed a lawsuit for four refugees. He sued the Portuguese National Line for $100,000 for breaching the contract. The SS Kwanzaa was held in port for six days. During this time, Rabbi Stephen Weiss of the Jewish World Jewish Congress, together with Cecilia Rosowski of the National Council of Jewish Women, lobbied for the remaining passengers' admittance to the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt was informed by the Jewish American Association of the situation. She appealed to her husband, the president. Roosevelt dispatched State Department official Patrick Murphy Mallon to investigate the matter. Allen gave visas to all 86 passengers. Six chose to return to Europe. The other 80 refugees entered the USA on September 14, 1940. The Salvador. On December 3, 1940, the Salvador, a tiny ship, left Varna, Bulgaria, with more than 350 emigrants. The ship's destination was Palestine. It sank in the Sea of Mar Mamara, next to the beach of uh, Silivri, Turkey. The date of that macabre event was December 12, 1940. In 1964, 223 bodies were buried in the National Civil Cemetery at Mount Herzl, Jerusalem, Israel. A memorial was built beside the graves. The Struma. Uh, John D. Pandalus was a Greek businessman, a shipping agent for the illegal immigration movement. His enterprise, based in Romania, led to the Balkans and eventually Greece. He used bribery, lies, and anything to get ships for refugees, no matter the ship's physical condition. Jewish organizations had to pay enormous sums of money to let the refugees board the ships, despite the poor condition of the vessels. Immediately at the beginning of the war, the Germans had bought all the decent ships they were used to carry supplies for the army. As a result, all the vessels available on the market were in deteriorated condition. The ship Struma, 150 long, feet long, was first registered in 1830 under the name Macedonia before the war. The Bulgarian owner used the vessel as a battle barge, a cattle barge on the River Danube. It was unfit for sea travel. The Struma, her new name, was towed to the city port of Constanta, Romania. Pandelis raised 
a, a Panamanian flag. The Batar, a young Zionist group, looked for passengers in Romania during September and October. The Romanian press carried advertisements for passengers on the Struma. When it was time to set sail, the passengers were stupefied. What they saw was a wreck of a ship. What had been shown to them previously were pictures of the Queen Mary. The passengers were depressed, worried, and gloomy. The ship had a depth of 18 feet, not enough to have prop a proper lower level. It could not hold more than 100 people. That didn't matter to the Greek agent as long as he and the authorities were paid. The refugees had to leave behind all their gold and jewelry in order to embark on, their, on the worn-down ship. As the immigrants were hurried into the lower quarters, they found cabins without cots, not as promised. There was no room to sit. The packed spaces could not hold the passengers, and many sat in the aisles. The ship resembled a coffin, not a boat. Batar's representatives, 60 of them, organized a large group into smaller groups for food, air, restroom, and washing periods. After one hour of sailing, the engine stopped. A distress signal had to be sent out prior to the engine losing its power. Meanwhile, the ship drifted. Late that night, a Turkish tugboat appeared for $2,500. The engineers would repair the engine. After the, the collection of rings, watches, and hidden money, the boat was ready to sail on. On Sunday, December 14th, the engine stopped working completely. By then, the Struma had reached the Bosphorus, gateway to Istanbul, Turkey. The captain flew the Turkish flag as a sign of friendship. Entrance to the strait had been mined by the Germans to prevent the entry of supplies for the Red Army. The area was covered by nets and equipped with bells to warn off ships. Finally, a Turkish tugboat appeared and began to tow the Struma toward Istanbul's harbor. The Churchill government of England was so adamant about not allowing illegal refugees to enter Palestine that they considered sinking all ships. On December 20th, 1941, five days after the Struma arrived to the coast of Turkey, there were talks between Turkish Foreign Office and the British ambassador in Ankara. Sir Harold uh, uh, McMichael, the British High Commissioner for Palestine, was determined that no illegal immigrants would disembark in Palestine. On December 27, 1941, again, the ambassador met with the Turkish foreign minister. The demand was to send the ship back into the Black Sea. Turkey did not want to have any part of the refugees, nor did the British. For 71 days, the British reprimand, rep, remained Im, Im, implacable. The Struma would not be allowed into Palestine. After some negotiation with British government, it was agreed to release children from the age of 11 to 16. The Turkish government refused to provide a boat, nor did they allow the children to go through Syria to reach Palestine via the land. In addition, the private secretary to Lord Moyne at the colonial office gave an emphatic reply of no. On February 23, 1942, after all avenues had been tried and failed, the Struma was ordered to leave Istanbul Harbor. On February 24, 1942, at 9 a.m., an explosion tore apart the Struma. 768 men, women, and children perished. There was one survivor, David uh, Stoliar, age 21, a Romanian Jew who entered Palestine. In 1942, the Jewish underground accused Sir Harold uh, McMichael, the British High Commissioner in Palestine, of murdering the Struma passengers. Thousands of posters were issued Murder, wanted for the murder of 800 refugees drowned in the Black Sea on the boat Struma. Wow. And a few more recipes. Hungarian tomato and pepper omelet and dough pockets filled with cheese. Kreplak. Whoa. Chapter 11. Will it ever cease? The wicked walk on every aisle. The wicked bend their bow ready their arrow on the bow, a bowstring to shoot in the dark. The wicked drew a sword and bent their bows. From the womb are the wicked estranged, the speaker of falsehood gone astray from birth. They have venom like the venom of a snake, like a deaf viper that closes its ear. Protect me, O Hashem. You will not allow your devout ones to witness destruction. Let me be rescued from my enemies. May, may they melt away like the water, like water that flows away. 
When each one draws his arrow, may they be as if crumbled to pieces. Seventy-one years ago, my mother, her family, and the rest of her village were forced from the, the known to the unknown after the holiday of Passover, all for sheer hatred. In 2015, the Passover holiday demonstrated more than ever before how widespread anti-Semitic feelings have penetrated different communities throughout the world, including the United States of America. On Wednesday, April 22, 2015, vandals armed with air, air guns attacked a synagogue under construction in Ar- Arkhangel, Russia. The following day... Following Thursday, the damage was found. Graffiti and anti-Semitic epitaphs were plastered on the building. There were broken windows as well. In Helsinki, Finland, on Thursday, April 23, 2015, posters of the Jewish member of parliament, Ben Ziskowitz, were vandalized with swastikas. Mr. Ziskowitz, a member of the National Coalition Party, is running in Finland's general election. He is the first Jew to be elected to the Finnish parliament. In the United States of America, Shari Torah Synagogue in Maryland was vandalized with swastikas and other anti-Semitic graffiti. In August 1936, the World Jewish Congress convened in Geneva. Rabbi Stephen Wise of the United States in his speech said the following, Hitlerism's real war is against world Jewry. Hitler said, uh, we are worden die Juden ausraten. We will root out the Jews. We answer, you shall not destroy the Jews, through, though you may uproot them from your land, for the Jew has within him the very essence of imperishableness. Rabbi Weiss of New York concluded with the historical facts that Haman in Persia and Titus of Rome failed with their mission. Hitler, he said, would also be unsuccessful. They slumped and fell down, fell, but we arose and were invigorated. And then she's got more recipes. Lakach, which is a sponge cake. Chapter 12, Hope. I have seen a wicked man powerful, well-rooted like a negative ever, neg, uh, native evergreen. He who sits in heaven will laugh. Hashem laughs at him, for he has seen his day approaches. O ruler, righteousness fills your right hand. The death blow of the wicked and the haters of the righteous will be condemned. For the wicked will perish, but the sinners are destroyed together. The destiny of the wicked is excised. For the arms of the wicked will be broken. May their table become a snare before them. Let the fierceness of your anger overtake them. You, Hashem, destroyed people and doomed the wicked. You blotted out their name. The account of Auschwitz. I gathered information regarding a former Nazi guard. The details about the former Nazi sergeant appeared in several places. The Isra Post, the website H, H.com, and continuous information on the Internet. That particular German person is Oscar Groening. On April 21st, 2015, in the city of Lunenburg, Germany, a Nazi named Oscar Groening, aged 93, stood trial. 71 years ago, he had been one of the guards in the infamous death camp Auschwitz-Birkenauer. The former SS sergeant testified that he volunteered to join the SS in 1940 after working for a short period of time at a bank. He became a guard in the camp from 1942 through 44. He added that when the Jews entered the camp, they were went through selection. Those who were weak or too young were gassed, and the rest were put to work doing slave labor. He was quoted, the enemies of the Germany of Germany were being exterminated. Oscar Groening described during the trial how he witnessed one of the guards finding a baby in one of the suitcases, probably hidden by his mother. The baby did not stop crying. The Nazi guard picked up the orphan and bashed it against the truck. He continued to testify, saying that he was responsible for recording all the money and gold that was taken away from the Jews. Everything that was collected was sent to Berlin. He was Auschwitz's accountant, Groening, added that the money belonged to the state, Germany. They didn't need it anymore. He was referring to the Jews, whose money was stolen. That money and other valuables belonged to my mother and her family and all the Jews who were herded into Auschwitz-Birkenau during May and June 1944. 
However, a lot of the valuables that were taken from, from the Jews, the SS men looked looted for themselves. Groening was charged with 300,000 counts of accessory to murder. He admitted that he had been he had witnessed individual atrocities, but he did not acknowledge participating in any crime. The charges against the former Nazi relate to the period in May and June 1944 when 25,400 Jews from Hungary, Romania were brought to Auschwitz-Birkenau. 300,000 were almost immediately gassed and put into the crematorium. In 1985, when, when Groening was originally put on trial, he admitted that he was an SS guard from 42. He defended himself by saying, I assume loyalty to my birth country, Germany. I thought that all the events that took place in Auschwitz were absolutely correct and proper. I was educated in this principle from the age of 10 and obeyed the law. This trial was the first to test a new line of German legal reasoning. Any SS who was, who was at the death camps as a guard can be charged as an accessory to murder committed there, even without evidence of involvement in, in a specific death. Currently, there are 11 open investigations against former Auschwitz guards. Charges have been filed in two more cases. As for the guards in uh, Majdanek, eight are under investigation. Under the German legal system, defendants do not enter for formal pleas. The accusers are 55 survivors, mostly from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Some of them are familiar family members of those who were murdered simply because they were Jews. On July 15, 2015, the former Nazi Oskar Groening was sentenced to four years in prison. There were more than 7,000 Nazi guards in this infamous death camp. Did all of them die natural deaths? Uh, where are they? Shouldn't they stand trial? EU's parliament demand. A European's demand to return Jewish property stolen during the Holocaust. This is the headline of an article that appeared in one of the weekly Jewish magazines in Florida. Representatives from 18 nations, members of the EU parliament, presented a signed letter to the president, Martin Schulz. The letter, all indicated, the letter indicated that all properties that were confiscated from the Jews should be returned to their rightful owners. The representatives spe specified that after 70 years, a solution had to be found regarding looted property. The 36 members wrote, we, the representatives of the EU parliament, carrying a moral obligation to bring forth a solution to return the stolen properties which belong to the Jews who were victimized during the Holocaust, 1933 to 1945. The coalition headed by a Swede, Gomar Hukmark, was quoted saying, my friends and I are proud to lead this committee to ensure that the EU parliament will focus on finding an answer to all the problems and difficulties the Jewish survivors are going through. I was stressed that the solution would be either returning the looted goods, or paying compensation. Escaping the conflagration. A light wind was blowing, cooling off our bodies, which warmed up quickly as the sun reached its zenith. We, the survivors, stood shoulder to shoulder, eyes filled up with tears, tears of joy and sadness. We had eluded the Nazis, but we left six million brethren behind. Six million souls killed slaughtered and buried to death still despite it all we on the boat's deck felt our hearts pounding filled with yearning for the hope to live and see hashem's promise to abraham come true to your offspring i will give this land whoa gaze now toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them so shall your offspring be is what the promise to abraham in the book of genesis is as we stood, young and old, men, women, and children, we were united in our determination to continue the legacy. Each one stretched out his hand to his or her neighbor's shoulder. Soft sounds of music engulfed us from the back of the ship. It continued like the sea's waves before pounding against the sea's shores. Loud voices erupted all around us. We all joined as one entity. We sang Hatikva, hat, hat, the hope. As long as in the heart within a Jewish soul still yearns, our hope is not yet lost. Well, and that's the, the, the end of the book, folks. 
at the end, you know, they end up with uh, the nation of Israel. And then she got a beautiful recipe for breaded chicken uh, uh, schnitzel cutlets. Whoa. It's beautiful. I love a good schnitzel. Uh. Author's note. Hashem examines the righteous one, but the wicked and the love of violence, but the wicked and the love of violence he despises. Do not cause me to be drawn with the wicked and with the doers of iniquity who speak peace with their companions, though evil is in their hearts. Let not the foot of the arrogant come to me, and let not the hand of the wicked move me. I hate the gathering of the of evildoers. And with the wicked, I did not sit. Turn from evil and do good. Guard your tongue from evil. Seek peace and pursue it. I have taken your ennobling testimonies as my, as my eternal, for they are the joy of my heart. The world must learn that hatred and bigotry toward anyone or any group of people must be eradicated. On the other hand, passivity begets evil. Each person ought to take the oath. Never be silent when encountering evil. Never again to no one. The end. Wow. Um, is all I can say. That was just uh, 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 an awesome uh, uh, recounting of a soul that went through all that at such a young age and then came uh, to the Holy Land. And I asked Bina if she, uh, cause I noticed uh, she had got her education in New York city. I asked, you know, if she was uh, an American, uh, she, she was born in Israel. So it sounds like her mother got out into Israel and got married and triumph after all for sure. So what an exciting story. It's nice to hear something genuine. We've been studying a lot of, a theological uh, material and, and stuff that is conceptual. Um, and this is just a real down to earth, uh, genuine, uh, uh, account of, um, uh, an actual life, uh, going through some terrible trauma. Uh, I can't imagine what it was like back then and just what these people had to endure. Uh, May it never happen again. May we all learn to stand up against such tyranny, such um, such practices that uh, try to herd people like uh, like animals and then dehumanize them. And um, oh, I don't know what to say. But folks, you know, um, I gotta let Bina know if we want to do a Zoom meeting tomorrow. So um, if anybody wants to, there's no sense hosting a zoom meeting if nobody's going to attend. So if anybody out there listening, if you want to attend a zoom meeting, please contact me immediately. Say something in the chat room, leave something in the chat room. I need to know, uh, if I don't hear from many people, uh, if I don't even have five people that will attend a zoom meeting, uh, there's no sense wasting the author's time. The exciting news is she's got a new book coming out and, um, you know, I started chatting with her about uh, possibly doing a documentary um, and, you know, we'll go one step at a time. But her next book has got uh, 10 family fa or 10 uh, Holocaust survivor uh, uh, stories. It's a, a bunch of shorts, but she's a well written author for sure. Uh, as an educator, um, yeah, her, her, uh, her grasp on the English language, put it out there in such a fashion that it's easy to read, clearly uh, displays exactly what she wants to convey. Uh, and the recipes, uh, you ladies will love this. So you can always, uh, like I say, find her book, Triumph After All, on her, her website. Uh, you can go to www.aspina.com, find the link uh, to purchase it on Amazon. You can get it for Kindle as low as $3.99. And you have access to these beautiful, beautiful recipes that are traditional Jewish recipes that go all the way back uh, into the old country in Eastern uh, Eastern Europe. So um, we hope that you guys have enjoyed this series uh, this week. I know we covered it very quickly. We had a wonderful visit and presentation by Bina. I will uh, determine uh, later today if um, we're going to have a Zoom meeting tomorrow. It's a question of how many people reach out. 
but I don't want to waste this lady's time. She's flying today, uh, tonight from uh, uh, Massachusetts back home to Florida. So um, I got to get a message to her. Uh, but if there's no questions, um, I think this time of year, you know, we all need to remember uh, from the past. And, uh, uh, you know, we have Remembrance Day coming up here in my country on November 11th and uh, all around the world. You know, we, we can't forget these horrors of the past uh, or we could be destined to repeat them. And uh, heaven forbid that ever happen again, something of that nature. Um, you know, and this is why I, I so promote the, uh, the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noak is, is uh, uh, I love the way Rabbi Shirky's book is called Brit Shalom, which is the covenant of peace. And when people understand that, that the, how the, the, the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noak are there to um, make the world a better place, literally work in this world to make it a, uh, a more peaceful place and to live in, in, in harmony with Hashem and with each other. And, um, you know, I, I so appreciate uh, the compassion that uh, Bina has shown here and, uh, and shared with us her, her actual uh, family history coming out of uh, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, the capture in their small city, and then in the... In the um, in the ghettos, oh, in Poland, that just, it just, yeah. Uh, may we never forget, um, and uh, may we stand strong and never let bullying and things of that nature continue. So, you know, on that note, folks, I think I'm done my time for today. So um, we're going to sign out for Rocky Mountain Readings. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, you know, Want to hear new book? Hope you guys enjoyed it. But I still thank you for each and every person that comes, the regulars that come and listen. Please let me know if you prefer, you know, story material or if you prefer the logical material. I really enjoyed that wonderful uh, all kinds of light up uh, thoughts wonderful wonderful stuff but um, yeah so I'm going to sign out for Rocky Mountain Readings um, let me know if you want to have a, a, a Zoom Room chat tomorrow with uh, Bina I, I want to encourage uh, any author or new author that's got feel something moving in their soul to just share with others uh, to get it down on paper, I mean, it can be done. It's not as difficult. And uh, then the second books become easier. And third, it's not as difficult as one thinks. One can become a profound writer just by putting their, their hand in, in, uh, in action. And uh, and this is what uh, BM No Hide's all about. It's about putting things into practice and uh, uh, your potential, reaching uh, your potential and being useful and fruitful in this world. And so, uh, you know, I'm thankful to everybody that comes out regularly and helps with some support. I wish you all the best. I'm going to sign out for now. Hopefully we'll be back tomorrow if I get enough questions. If not, bye for now.